It means I am a seed. This song instills pride and embodies me with a sense of belonging. Yet that wasn't always the case. I was born into an impoverished, dysfunctional home with no knowledge of my native language, identity, or culture. It was fueled by a lifestyle indicative of the movie Once Were Warriors. The child abuse I experienced was severe. I would go into a trance as a coping mechanism for dealing with abuse. Battle of voices in my head. Have to deal with flashbacks of trauma that would leave me traumatized. I was five years old when I became a ward of the state. I spent 11 years in social welfare homes and boys' homes. I was 17 when I came across a situation similar to my own a father abusing his five-year-old son. Five months later, things came to a head when friends and I, who grew up together in the social welfare homes, were sharing our experiences of abuse. The mother of the child was there. She was much older than us. She fueled our emotions by telling us more about what was happening to her son. I didn't know it at the time, but I was carrying emotional and psychological baggage from my past. It created a chain reaction, superimposing my history over the boy to such a degree, I ended up killing his father. When we got to our trial, we learned that everything that we'd been told over those five months was a lie. This wasn't about child abuse. It was about a life insurance policy. I felt betrayed, manipulated, and devastated when I came to the realization that my traumatic past blinded me, that my history, my demons, my anger at my own abuser cost an innocent man his life. I was convicted of first degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. Five years into my sentence, an actress Miranda Harcourt brought a play to prison called Verbatim. She played a variety of characters impacted by the act of murder. I asked her, what did you hope to achieve by sharing this with us? She said to me, how would you answer that? I envisioned a stone drop into a pond and creating ripples. The main character that she was portraying thought he was only hurting one other but didn't realize the impact of his actions would ripple throughout his community. Alone in my cell reflecting, my inner being asked me this question, what about the ripple effects in the community you caused? I was shocked. I never even contemplated the consequences of my actions. I was too ashamed. Then I came to the realization that there was a family, a community, who were grieving, whose hearts were broken because of me. I didn't even contemplate the actions of my own family. They were ostracized in their own community. My mother hid away due to shame. My brother was assaulted at school because of me. I came to the realization that I had two deficit legacies I needed to address. I was released from prison after serving nearly 11 years of a life sentence. I was 28 years old. I'd spent 22 of those years incarcerated in one form or another. 
The first deficit legacy I got to address is when I joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I was in the temple when I came across an uncle of the man I killed. If I was to put myself in his shoes, how would I feel if I came face to face with a man who killed a member of my family? He said through his tears, if I met you anywhere else except in this temple, I would never forgive you. But for a Latter-day Saint, the temple is the most sacred place on earth. We ended up embracing, and he invited me to his home to meet his family. I was really apprehensive at first. When I got up to introduce myself, I told them who I was, I told them what happened and why. I expected them to abuse me. I expected to be hated, but that's not what happened. They rose as a family, they surrounded me and they embraced me. And they said, we forgive you. I ended up doing an article with the auntie and uncle in the Waikato Times. This was about the power of the atonement it was about the power of redemption and the hardest thing I ever had to do. It exposed me to the world with all my faults, flaws, scars, warts and all. But it was necessary to give this family a voice that we could begin our healing journey together. The second deficit legacy I got to address is when I joined the education field 20 years ago. I decided to use education as a vehicle to create a new legacy, one that my family could be proud of. When I completed my bachelor degree, I became a lecturer at WinTech, teaching in the area of counselling, social work and mental health. I went on to commence a master's in counselling, a master's in commercial music and a PhD in philosophy. Then I won three doctoral scholarship awards. The most prestigious was when I became the Ngāri VC and 28th Māori Battalion doctoral scholar. Now this was awarded in Parliament, or Māori MPs, Ministry of Defence and Ministry of Education had to be informed about my history. I won that award via unanimous vote. And then I was invited onto the alumni board then I became the Te Atawhai Te Ao Doctoral Scholar and the Waikato Tainui, Tainui Doctoral Scholar for my work in the area of Māori experiences of historical intergenerational trauma. The basis of my thesis asked this question. What the heck was that history all about and where did it come from? And why were there so many Māori children like me put into the social welfare home and pipeline to prison? I take full responsibility for my actions. But I learnt this on the way. I learnt that we grow up in the face of our histories, born into environments constructed by others. I wanted to know how that environment was constructed. My research led me into a journey into the history of colonisation, to the doctrine of discovery. The doctrine of discovery became the foundation of all international law. It was created by the European monarchy and sanctioned by the Pope and the Catholic Church. Papal Bull decrees or official declarations of the Pope determined the process for engaging with indigenous peoples and indigenous lands from the 14th century through to today. Romanus Pontifex, 1455, declared that if all indigenous nations were non-Christian, they had to be invaded, vanquished, captured, subdued, reduced to perpetual slavery, and to have their possessions and properties seized by the European monarchs. Taranalas, 1493, determined that if land was empty, it could be claimed by the European crown who found it. Secondly, if there were indigenous peoples there and they were not Christian, they didn't have right to entitlement of land, only rights of occupancy. What this meant was this, their status as human was lowered to that of a hedgehog, a hare, a rabbit, or a tree. 
They were determined to be flora and fauna. You might think that that is ancient history, but the last time this was used was by the US Supreme Court in 2007. The doctrine of discovery as applied by the European monarchies can be tracked all around the world and led to the genocide, ethnocide and linguicide of hundreds of millions of indigenous peoples and indigenous lands for nearly 700 years. The psychological impact of the doctrine of discovery is evident in all indigenous cultures affected by colonisation. Deficit statistics in poverty, displacement, alienation, drug and alcohol, suicide is comparable right across the indigenous world. This is a historical analysis of four generations of my family. To the right, you will find legislative policies which I superimposed over each generation and enabled me to determine the legislative environment each generation was subject to. My great-grandfather was born in 1840. He fought against the British and the settlers at Rangalili and Oraco Par in the 1860s as a result of the Waikato invasion. They ended up losing resources, assets, and over a million acres of land. It left them impoverished and destitute. My grandfather was brought up by Princess Tupuya. He could only speak Te Reo Māori. He was taken by the social welfare, put into a home and beaten daily until he learned how to speak English. As a result, he wouldn't teach his children Māori culture or language. My father was brought up in the aftermath of World War II. He had two fathers that went away to fight for the 28th Māori Battalion. They fought for rights of citizenship. They fought to become equal partners in the Treaty of Waitangi. And as successful as they were, they came back broken and traumatised. What little land they didn't have left was taken off them and given to the settler soldiers. It left them wandering from the rural sectors into the town as a part of the pepper potting process. The pepper potting strategy was utilised to break up Māori communities. The pub became their marae. They weren't taught to value anything Māori. They became the once were warriors generation. This is not about justifying my actions at all, but can giving historical context to the environment I was born into. So I've made it my life's work to address this history through education, research and development. I am a postdoc research fellow recipient at Te Whare Wānanga o Awanuarangi, Indigenous University in Whakatāne, and I'm developing a pilot program for community and prisons called Te Kaka Noaho. With the advent of colonisation removing our native language, identity and culture, Te Kaka Noaho teaches us two things. Who we are. We are a seed born of greatness. Where we come from, we come from a line of chiefs. I've developed an exercise that brings memories to the fore. These can be triggered through taste, smell, words, or a song. A song can trigger a memory that would have one meaning for one person, that could trigger a memory that will have a different meaning for another. So I'm going to play a song from three different eras and I invite you to go on a walk down memory lane to remember features of that era for you. Donna Summer's Last Dance, the 70s era. Disco was popular, so was Happy Peace. What was that era like for you? For me, it was the era of trauma, of beatings and abuse. Here's another one. The 80s era. 
Michael Jackson's album Thriller was the number one of the decade. Break dancing became popular at that time. So it was poor year. What was this era like for you? For me, it was the era of incarceration, of gang violence and isolation. Here's one for the younger generation. So that's the early 2000s. Lord of the Rings came out. Russell Coots successfully defended the America's Cup. What was that era like for you? For me, it was the era of transformation, of gaining my qualifications, of giving back to my community. I hope you've learned a little bit about the power of triggers. Here, Kakonoaho takes a person on a journey back into their history. It unpacks their stories to help them make sense of their current reality, then seeks to implement transformative strategies there. I hope you've learned a little bit about historical intergenerational trauma, the doctrine of discovery, the papable decrees. And I also hope that the next time you see a prisoner, you might think about this talk and look at things from a different perspective. Do not judge a person in isolation to their history. To understand that all issues and behaviours, they have a whakapapa or a genealogy. Those issues or behaviours came from somewhere for some reason. They didn't just manifest out of thin air. He kākonoa ho tracks that issue or behaviour back to its origin and then seeks to resolve it there. My friend and colleague, Dr Ingrid Higgins in the way, we spent the last few years teaching these concepts to social workers, counsellors, psychologists, criminologists, social service providers from both a Māori perspective and a Pākehā perspective. Because as treaty partners, it's about how we engage in shared space, how we get on the same page. Nō reira, I leave you with this. He kāko noa hau, e ruia mai e rangi aotea, for I will never be lost, I'm a seed born of greatness, descended from a line of chiefs. Nō reira. Tenakoto, tenakoto, tenakoto katoa.